I am likewise recording video. How about that? <clears throat> How about it? Number 12. Yes, episode Zwolf. Is that 12? Yes. In German? Zwolf. Zwolf. That sounds mm. awesome. Yep. Ah, okay. Let's get to it, shall we? Let's get to it. I really want to say episode Zwolf now. <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> sure, like, yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I don't know. I don't know. What, Eleven, but yeah, I'm pretty sure twelve is uh, zwölf, and then dreizig, vierzig, fünfzig. You got pretty, you got pretty natural accent there, Drew. Sieben I'm kind Sieg. of impressed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode number twelve of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet, and I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about all of the things going on in Goulet Pens and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about where fountain pens are made, why stub nibs are the way that they are, and our grail pens du jour. <laughs> Right, our, our current grill pens, because let's be real, it changes a lot, and especially if we actually acquire it. Uh, let's start out with some feedback. Drew, what have you been hearing about previous episodes we've done? I heard some things, Brian. I heard some, you heard things. some things. You heard I some heard things? I heard some things. I heard some things since last week. Yeah. <laughs> so we last week spoke about the need for cartridges to be able to be plugged or resealed so you can uh -huh, use them at a later uh -huh. date. And we got some feedback. There are some that are made by smaller um, you know, people. Uh, there are some available in Europe, I believe. Um, but uh, a YouTube commenter, Raven Wind, mm -hmm. said that they actually plug full cartridges for use later with snipped off bits of O-ring, like an O-ring that's the right diameter to plug a hmm. cartridge opening. They clip it at an angle so it's kind of sharper on one end so it inserts nice, nicely and then the diameter is such that the rubber plugs it up nicely. That's a super affordable way to uh, get it done. So I feel like huh. that's a that's a solid idea. It might that would take have some to be, yeah, I would think that would have to be an O-ring that's bigger than yeah. something you would like eyedropper a pen with. This would yeah, be like no, no, you'd have to go to the hardware o -ring. store. Yeah, it's got to be some thicker. Maybe something you can get at like the hardware store. Yeah, or something absolutely. Like that. Something you could get at the hardware <laughs> store. So you might need to trial and error it a little bit. But I thought that was a really uh, good idea for an affordable that's, way to uh, get that done. Yeah, honestly, I can say I've never heard that before. So good job, Raven. Yeah, it's first, and first I've heard of it. Twelve years. And rubber, we know, is like one of the most effective ways to actually seal liquid into a chamber. Like that's yeah the industry standard. So absolutely, if it's good, good enough for an O-ring like inside the pen's mechanism, it's good enough to seal a cartridge. I would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Very good. And hmm. Marsha on YouTube, more importantly, had to vouch for the sausage on a stick encased in pancake. So we talked wow. about that last time, how there exists a corn, a breakfast corn dog, essentially, where instead of a hot dog wrapped in cornbread, it is a sausage link wrapped in pancake batter. Wow. And coincidentally, Marsha here had one the morning the pencast went live <laughs> on YouTube. So she's so a fan. She's got personal experience with it. Wow. Very personal that day. In fact, I, I believe that at some point, Brian, you're going to need to uh, acquire one of these and have one live on the pen cast because I need to see your reaction to this thing. I'm not opposed to it. I'm not going to like Rachel's reaction when you told her about this. She was like, ah, uh, that does not sound so great. No, it did uh, not. Me personally, I'm like, hmm, I would eat that. Is it, it, is it, what does it say about me that now I really want to see Rachel try one? Is that oh you're malicious? It's not going to happen. Rachel does not. Rachel does not do things that you <laughs> that you want her to do if she doesn't want to do them. That's just not. That's not. How, that's not how she works. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but me on Fair the other enough. hand, yeah, you can convince me to pretty much try most anything. Yeah, no, I, and and I have. There, we we have a storied oh, yeah. history of that. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, then one, one 
one bit of feedback that um, we also got. Actually, I didn't. E- we didn't even get it. I got it at home because I told my wife Shannon about the oft-used movie slash TV quotes that we talked about last episode, and she was like, "Yep, yeah, we do use all those." But you didn't use the Ghostbuster quote that we always use. I was like, "Oh my God, you're right." We always say whenever one of us does something that the other one is like not approving of, we say, "What did you do, Ray?" And that's because when Ray inadvertently summoned the giant Stay Puff Marshmallow Man to destroy the city, uh, Peter Venkman, when Ray realizes what he did, is like, what did you do, Ray? And it's just this wonderful accusatory phrase that can apply to a number of different situations, including um, Gozer the Destructor taking the form of a giant marshmallow mascot. Nice. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Ghostbusters. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Uh, you know, actually, it's funny that you brought that up, not specifically Ghostbusters, but the whole movie TV quote thing, because ever since we did the podcast last week, every time I say something that's from a TV or a movie, I'm like, ah, oh, I should have mentioned this one in the podcast, yeah. you know, so I'm realizing just how many now I actually quote, but, uh, you know, one from 30 Rock that I realized was, uh, it's never too late for now. Um, definitely say that one quite a bit. And, uh, another one from Seinfeld that came up. Uh, that Rachel and I say all the time was, uh, well, good luck with all that. That was a Jerry Seinfeld thing. I forget the exact context of it. It was it was one of those like subtle, deeper things. It wasn't like a whole theme of a show. That but one basically, sounds like it has a wide array of applications. Yeah, it's like basically when somebody's going through like a whole bunch of stuff, Jerry and his ambivalent self is kind of like, well, good luck with all that. <laughs> and then just kind of like leaves. Yeah. So <laughs> whenever Rachel or I is dealing with like some deep like technical issue or something at work, we're like, well, good luck with that. And then we're like out of there. Um, yeah, so that's pretty funny. Um, got some feedback from uh, an anonymous person on Instagram. Uh, so said, sorry um, to ruin his pyrotechnic fantasies but please let Brian know that they stopped making ping pong balls out of celluloid around 10 years ago. Aww. I'm sure you can still probably find plenty made of celluloid though. I've played table tennis for 20 years and it caused quite the stir when they changed the material, I can imagine. I think the official reason for the change was to allow for faster global shipping as the new ones can be shipped via air freight, whereas the flammable celluloid ones had to be shipped via boat because of their flammability. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. I did huh. not realize that they had changed. So I have no idea what celluloid is currently used to manufacture primarily. Nitrocelluloid, at least. Yeah. Um, the, fun, and then, the fun celluloid. <laughs> yep. And then Jorge on YouTube, uh, also related to celluloid, said that billiard balls were once made of celluloid. And then this kind of gets into the historical context of chemistry, which is what we discussed last week. Uh, billiard balls were one of those things that used to be made out of ivory. And uh, that obviously was not sustainable or very eco-friendly or very kind to elephants and rhinos. Uh, so when they when billiards started to take off in the mid 1800s, around the time of fountain pens and such, um, they were looking for alternate materials. So as plastic started to be developed, uh, they tried it out with celluloid. However, Jorge said that when they struck each other, it wasn't uncommon for the impact to produce a mild explosion. So if you thought that billiards was an exciting game now, just imagine if the balls could randomly explode when they hit each other. So uh, that's kind of cool. And now I kind of want to go search YouTube for exploding billiard ball videos. I'm sure I'm sure there's some out there, right? Yeah, like, I saw the com- I saw that comment and I was like, wait, really? So I Googled it real quick. And sure enough, yeah, they said that the sound was akin to a percussion cap or something like that. Like it was a loud. Oh, like one of those like snap snap guns that you get at like the drugstore or something. Yes, it was it was loud enough to startle people. The The person that was being interviewed said that people would actually draw guns in the in the um, uh, billiard hall, oh, in like or a, in like a saloon or something. Yeah, because like... because because they were like, you know, <laughs> what some... sound like a gunshot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So wow. it was loud enough. It was definitely loud enough to startle people. So, um, but okay. it didn't. I don't think it made the ball explode. It was just like at the point of impact, it would cause a, you know, spark or something. I guess. And I would have to imagine that would like make the ball not. <laughs> roll very smoothly <laughs> like random parts or of it would are roll really smoothly i don't know i don't know yeah. to what degree the explosion happened but uh, i don't i don't wow. think the balls actually exploded i think it, it was like, like a... an, it was like an exterior <laughs> thing a superficial explosion fair enough fair enough more like a like a striking of a match than like an explosion perhaps yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Interesting. Like, remember, yeah remember those 
um, balls. I don't know if you ever got one of these, Brian, but whenever I would go to the science museum as a kid, like in a field trip or something, they would have these like balls you could slam together and it would like make sparks. Did you ever get oh, one yeah. of those? Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what it's called, but yeah, it was like those, coated in something like yeah. something that would like the friction cause it to. Yeah. Something like that. But eventually <laughs> you used them up and all the coating wore off and they wouldn't explode anymore. Yeah, they were kind of smooth, right? But it had like kind of a powdery, almost kind yeah. of like feel to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. That sounds like those a great idea for a kid. Yeah, yeah, let's just give kids like, I don't think know, they make those anymore. I cannot imagine in today's litigious society that they're giving <laughs> like explosive coated balls to children at museums. Yeah, probably not. Though I might be surprised. I don't know. I don't know. My kids have never gotten any explosive toys yeah i can't say mine have either i mean they don't <laughs> even do cap guns really anymore nah not so much yeah all right moving on to some new stuff uh, new one thing stuff that, yeah the one thing that i had to share about something that's going to be coming soon every year pilot does a limited edition vanishing point and this year's vanishing point has been released in the information not the pen itself uh the, the information about the pen what it's going to be has been made public and is going to be called black ice it is an ombre that goes from a blue to a black gotta say looks pretty slick so if you liked the uh crimson if you liked the um twilight yeah crimson what was it crimson i want to say crimson tide but that's not there right. was a there was a tequila sunrise tequila there sunrise was, and there was a and, crimson the crimson one i can't remember the name i of don't it. remember what the crimson one was called maybe it's tequila sunrise gosh i really should look these up anyway sorry we have a whole history blog post of the different vanishing points if you want to look them up year by year this one will get added to it um i don't know exactly how many we're going to get it's not going to be it's it's a limited global amount so every year they make the number of pens that represents that year so there's going to be 2021 of these pens globally so we're going to get some portion of that as you can imagine only 2000 pens and change in the whole world every retailer is going to get just a little little bit of them so if you really really want this pen go and get it it's medium nib only and uh it's expensive you know it's it's more expensive than a regular vanishing point you're looking at 257 to get one of these pens but they usually sell pretty quickly they have a limited edition box so it's not just your regular vanishing point box it's definitely more of a collectible thing if you really just want to write with a vanishing point just get a regular vanishing point because it's literally just a different color a vanishing point but if you're like me and have kind of inadvertently created a vanishing point collection you kind of are just bound by your own obsessiveness to go and pick it up. So if you're so inclined, we're going to have that. Uh, I don't know exactly when it's going to be coming, Drew. I don't know if you know. I really should have looked on the site. Um, but no, but uh, soon ish. By time, it's usually by time, September. Yeah, by, by time this um, podcast airs, I will have put it on Instagram. <laughs> there you go. I'm looking at the what we have on our site. It just says coming in September. So that's all we know. That's that's our, This is around the time when it comes out every year. So be coming out but yeah check it out looks pretty slick black trim looks good black nib looks looks nice it's a bad ombre oh yeah all right drew what about you what's new um well we're going to be launching uh by the time this is published we will have launched the newest private reserve ink and their first limited edition um you know kind of one shot deal ink which is going to be called private reserve two minutes to midnight blue and it's in a new box, new sh bottle shape um, with a very interesting label. It's a completely new design. Um, it is available elsewhere. We're kind of on the tail end of picking it up and uh, actually making it available. But it'll be there. You can buy it. It's a nice dark, deep blue. I'll put a picture up here, you know, so you can see that. But that'll be out, and that's exciting. So get it while you can. Yeah. First uh, limited edition PR that I think that's come out since they kind of rebooted. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, they have the the you know pen show inks here and there, but this one, yeah. this one, this one is, is kind of its own thing. It, it there's no event that it's kind of you know celebrating. It's just a, a limited edition special ink. So there you go. Definitely the first it's of its kind. Very cool. And then we launched uh, earlier this week, but it'll be a regular edition, the Retro 51 Chromatic Rollerball, which is a super cool looking rollerball. Um, I have one here. Oh yeah, let's take a look at it. Yeah, so I'll put this, um, I, you know, I'll put a better image up as well, but. Um... Now it's kind of hard to tell. It's kind of hard to tell from like static images on the site. Is there any iridescence to this pen or is it more just like a, a flat ombre? 
kind of coloration? It's, it, the latter. It's more of a flat okay. ombre. It does not, um, the color variation doesn't change depending okay. on where you have it. It is. Yeah, some we've had that have been like the iridium, like the PVD coated kind of stuff. It's slightly different from that. I imagine this is more like a layered lacquer kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, is it's, that, is that the kind where of it is it yellow, it shall remain yellow. Where it is purple, it shall remain purple, etc. Gotcha. Cool, cool. So it's not Good iridescent, deal. but I mean, it is, it's iridescent, it's frozen in time. It's not just, it's not, it's, it's, mm. it's done iridescing. It has iridesced. It's it last. Ir it's iridesced. <laughs> it's iridesced. Yes. Okay. It's more. It's more like just a rainbow ombre than it is like. It's a rain rainbow ombre. Yes. Ra wow, that rolls off the tongue. <laughs> no. Pick up your rainbow ombre, come chromatic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Retro fifty one tornado rainbow ombre chromatic. That's what they call it officially. Mm. Definitely not. Drew, we should be in. We should be in marketing. Oh positions. yeah, we would just yes. We should absolutely. We should be in public positions to talk yes, about and only name only with the pens that sell, regardless of what ridiculous name we call it, <laughs> like the like the rainbow break. Like the <laughs> there you go, awesome. All right, moving on to Q and A. Q and A. All right, the first question we have is from an email, Brian, and this person. I'm assuming it's a person. We can't really be sure. It's that anonymous. One could surmise. It could be a Sasquatch. Anyway, please list the country of origin slash manufacturer since many consumers prefer to purchase products based on that knowledge. That's true. A lot of people do want to purchase things from certain countries. Yeah. So I why don't we do that, Brian? Uh, we do. We do do that when we can. Um, so, I mean... One thing we do get feedback about sometimes is when we have some facts about pens, people would like to be able to filter by those options. That's not always something that we have the feasibility to do. And this is, I wanted to take this question because I thought this is a good opportunity to kind of talk about that a little bit. And then I kind of did a, not a deep dive, but like a, like a medium dive. You there's know, some like words. A, there, there are some words here that you wrote down. Like a picking up a picking up the rings on the bottom of like the five foot section of the pool. Maybe that's like the dive that I'm talking about. Um, you know, you know what I mean. Have your my kids have done swim lessons this summer, so that's that's where I'm coming out with that. Sure. Not like jumping off the diving board into the the ten foot section, but like you know going to the bottom of the pool with the goggles and picking up. You the know rings. what? I think we're good on the intro, Brian. <laughs> okay. I do. Have I teed it up nicely? Do I need to explain <laughs> some more the metaphor that I'm going with? Ah. Okay. Um, so yes, two. So two different parts of it. One of that is, um, you know, if we don't have really solid information to go off of for pretty much every pen, it doesn't really do a ton of good necessarily to have a filter for it on our website. You know, for example, this is this is one area where we may know where the pen was made, we may not know. We may not be able to find out because it's not made public to us. Um, and so that might mean that there would be a pretty decent portion of products that basically have like an unknown or unlisted, you know, kind of tag to them on, on the filter when you go to look for them on the site. And that might, you know, ask, raise more questions than we have answers to. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it definitely, plus, you know, there's, there's already a lot of filters on our site and as nice as it is to be able to drill down and get pretty much whatever detailed filtering kind of information you want, you know, at some point we gotta, we gotta draw the line. Um, and if, usually we tend to draw the line at places where we already don't have the most solid information. So it's like, yeah, there's only some pens we could even include in that filter. Um, so that's, that's one, you know, thing that we discuss. Uh, regularly and, and may or may not be an option for us. Plus, I don't know if there's any limitations on our site in terms of number of filters. There's some programming and stuff that gets into that. It increases load times and all that type of stuff. So there's a lot of factors, blah, yeah, blah, blah, behind the curtain unlike, stuff. Uh, unlike our podcast where we very gladly talk about things we don't know about, when it comes to actually operating our website and conducting the business, that's actually a pretty heavy-duty sticking point. You know, we act, yes, that's one of yes. our ed Education is one of our core values. And if we don't feel yeah. like we can properly educate behind it or define the why behind any sort of action, we generally don't do it because we do feel very, very strongly about our commitment to you to be able to educate on our products, you know, the way we do things, you know, so yeah, yeah. We, we tend we tend to avoid it if we can't really define it. Yeah. Um, so where I went a little, a little deeper on this, answering this question was about 
how do you define where something is actually made, right? Because this is a thing that we're dealing with in today's kind of global economy. Uh, it's very clear sometimes when something is, you know, 100% made in Florence or 100% made in the USA or whatever. And oftentimes those manufacturers are very proudly kind of displaying that, marketing it, kind of putting it out there. It becomes a selling point. And then of course the natural desire would be, yeah, I would like to know where everything is made and have that kind of be very public, right? Um, but sometimes it's not so crystal clear, especially when there are things that are made in different countries, different components made in different countries. Um, a lot of times there's different brands where certain models of pen will be made in one country and other models of pen will be made in another country. More often, I won't speak specifically about any one brand because there's a number of brands out there, but oftentimes, you know, if they're in a, you know, particular country where, you know, maybe just uh, you know, the hand, there's like a high end kind of handcrafted element to the brand. They might have it in their kind of native country. And if there's more of an economy model of their line, which may or may not even be fountain pens, it may be they have like ballpoints or other, you know, kind of more, I don't know, like art supplies and things like that. They may have those made in a different country, you know, more economic country. It's more of a mass production kind of thing. Uh, and so then it becomes even more confusing to communicate clearly where something is made because you can't basically just go buy a particular brand. You have to almost break it down by model. Um, so that does get interesting. So that's where I dove in a little bit online and researched like, when do you actually get to call something as made in a certain country? Mm. Um, now it varies. It got really confusing really fast. And I'm out of my depth because I'm not a manufacturer. And I haven't consulted like lawyers on this kind of thing, but I did look at the Federal Trade Commission, um, at least in the USA, the Federal Trade Commission is the governing organization that determines when you can say that something is made in the USA, right? So that is a kind of a specific thing. Um, there's actually no laws requiring that a manufacturer uh, state that any of US made product is actually made in the USA. So you can't say that it's made in the USA if it's not, but if it is made in the USA, you don't have to say that it is, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. with, the, with the exception of automobiles, textiles, textiles, fur, and wool, for some reason. Those are required to say it's made in the USA if it is. Um, the whole country of origin thing gets really complex because um, first off, it's not then determined by the Federal Trade Commission. It's actually determined more by the Customs and Border Protection. Um, and that becomes more of a much cloudier thing depending on what country it's coming from and so on. Every country has different rules about when you can say something's made in their country. But I think the general understanding is that it's often determined that when there's a the last substantial transformation, whenever that happens, that's when it's considered made in that country. So let's use a fountain pen as an example. You have the nibs maybe made in one company or in one country like Bach and Jovo, they're in Germany. They're one of the more popular nib manufacturers that other companies might use, right? So the nibs are made in Germany. The converters might be made somewhere completely different. The trim might be made somewhere completely different. The resin may come from Italy or somewhere else. You know, when you take all these different components and you put them all together, well, those are not substantially transformed until you actually like make it into a pen, right? But then it becomes cloudy. So say like the raw components are manufactured, those components are then maybe shipped, say to the US, and then the pen itself is actually assembled into an actual pen. You could argue like, is that the last substantial transformation? Because you're taking a bunch of parts and then you're turning it into a pen? Or is it when the parts themselves are actually manufactured? Fountain pens are a really small industry. So quite frankly, I don't think it's like really hot on customs and borders and FT, you know, Federal Trade Commission to like really have a lot of rules around fountain pens specifically. So quite frankly, I just don't really know. I don't know when it's determined that the last substantial transformation has been made on a fountain pen. Um, so that is a good question. And it's something I may kind of just probe some of our manufacturers about, even just knowing that like, hey, this is something that people value in knowing. Uh, and so is there just more clarity that we can provide people um, in saying where things are coming from? So there's all kinds of things and I, you can get super deep and super legalistic about some of these things. But, you know, more or less, the, the reason you have all this stuff in place is so that you're not 
saying that something is made in one country, but in fact, it's not. So um, that's usually not the circumstance that we end up in in the fountain pen world. It's more just a matter of, you know, it gets complicated in even determining that. And frankly, pens are such a small industry that it's often not something that, you know, probably most companies are that worried about um, actually clarifying unless, you know, we as consumers, um, you know, want them to do so. And so it's something I'm curious to get some feedback on how much everybody actually values these things or is it nice to have or matters with some or pens over a certain price or if it's like a $20 pen, do you even care? And I'm just kind of curious. So, um, you know, I dove in enough to know that like, oh boy, okay, this is... (laughs) This is something I could really get quickly out of my depth, but that's what I was able to kind of just read and understand a little bit. I know it gets complicated real quick and I'm not a manufacturer, but um, I did find it to be, you know, pretty interesting. And there's, believe me, there's like a bulleted breakdown of all these different industries and there's all these different exceptions for other weird things like custom artwork and all these other other things. So it's a deep rabbit hole. I can tell. And I'm cutting myself off. Well Next done. Question. There Next are there question. are yeah. The, we we definitely we've, we've also heard of pens where like all of it's made in one country, but like the clip isn't. So it could be as much yeah. as that. So there really is. It is a very very hard to define. Yeah, thing. like wh- there's no there's no clear rule about like what percentage of it has to be made or what is substantial transformation. It, it gets it gets yeah it gets cloudy. Anyway. And I, and we do not feel educated enough to be the ones to make that distinction. <laughs> Yeah, but it is, you know, we do know manufacturers, so we could ask them you yeah, know, we how can, much we they've studied up this, this kind of thing. Yeah, we, can, we might need to, you know, revisit this rabbit hole one day. Yeah, I would love to. I would love I'll bring to. a pillow. All right, sounds good. All right. Um, All right. I got yeah, the next, next question. Next, next question. Yep, this is from Evie Kirk on Instagram. Why are stub nibs mostly 1.1 well, said centimeters, but pretty sure you mean millimeters. It's millimeters, yeah. Uh, why such a specific width of 1.1? Well, a long time ago, Evie, there was an ancient chief of a long forgotten tribe lost to the annals of history. And he put a curse on the settlers that invaded his village and stole his magical um, uh, llama shaped rock that um, he used to you know, control the weather. And um, he. Uh, Basically, 1.1 was the uh, the measurement of the llama's left ear, and that was the the cursed llama ear. And since then, uh, the no, it was 1.0. So you can't call anything 1.0 because it's bad luck. The ancient chief llama ear. Uh, mm. we'll so is that ever like respect or maybe fear? A fear, or? absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, re- yeah. Re- reawaken the curse. Oh, definitely wouldn't yeah. want to do that. Mm-hmm. No, so that's why uh, 1.1. Stay away from the uh, 1.0. So for like the pilot vanishing point that has a 1.0, is that uh, is that a problem? Uh, bad juju, man. Or like the Pelican script has a 1.0. Mm, you know, just kind bad. of wondering. Don't do it. Kind of wondering if that's a problem. Don't do it. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if, you, if you want the llama god to come come get you man i mean you, i don't i don't think anybody wants that now no let me tell you those things will spit on you mm-hmm. they will pee everywhere <laughs> llamas can pee let me tell you <laughs> i've seen oh it God. i've seen it in person <laughs> so we uh, we grew up in the we grew up in the city of richmond drew you know maymont maymont park uh, Anybody familiar with Richmond? Maymont Park is pretty, pretty popular. So they have some animals. I'm writing that you know. down in the book, Brian. They have saying, "Are you putting it in my quote book?" I'm putting it in the book. Llamas so, um, can pee, man. Yeah. Well, they had some llamas there, and I remember standing there in awe. Cause I was like, I was, I was maybe Joseph's age. I was like 11 or 12, something like that, and on like a school trip or summer, summer camp trip or something, going to Maymont Park, and there was a llama. I'd never seen a llama before, and I was just watching. I was like, "Oh, haha, that llama's peeing," and it just kept peeing like <laughs> just kept peeing and i was like how is it still peeing like that memory still sticks with me today <laughs> i'm so glad i came up with that bs story because now it's like that that was i was you annoying never, myself with that one but then then it then you you came in and saved you never know that. you never know where the pen cast is gonna take you but uh, yeah let me get, let me <laughs> let me just um let me give the viewing public um brian's oh, gonna, last brian's <laughs> last quote here Oh no, I spilled barbecue on my Rubik's Cube. Yes. That happened. Those 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 magical moments that I just want to hang on to from uh Yeah. We do, we got do a lot keep, of, got a lot of good ones. 
We got a lot of good ones. Rachel has some of the best ones. She has many, many quotable yeah. quotes. But no, literally, um, I, I think we were about to record a pencast, and like you just spilled barbecues, like actual we were, barbecue. We were, a, we we're having a meeting, and as, as often happens, sometimes I that my was day it. gets my day gets turned upside down, and I have to kind of work through my lunch. And uh, I had I was the little mini Rubik's cubes that I had for the mosaic, and I was yeah, kind of sh- yeah. I was kind of showing you like, hey, look, I did the mosaic, you know. <laughs> And then I had I had a bunch of barbecue and I just straight up dropped a huge glob of it right on the cubes. But just Not the fact, like, oh no, Not I got good. barbecue on my Rubik's cube. Oh yeah. man, probably the only time you'll ever hear that specific. I know, but I loved it. Well, no, for real though, <laughs> the the one point one distinction. Honestly, I've measured like the width of the nibs. I've measured yeah. the width of the stroke. Like. There's what, like what actually could, is the 1.1 versus a 1.0? Where is that actually? Because that's down to a tenth of a millimeter. That's pretty right. darn small. I've, I've measured I've measured like 1.5s that were not 1.5s at all. I've measured 1.1s mm. that were not. I've measured 1.0s that were bigger than what they say. So the distinction, I, I really have no idea, Evie. I wish I did, but it's. I would say it's borderline arbitrary, honestly. I think it's more or less just to give you like a guideline of what approximately it's going to be. Why they settled on 1.1, I have no idea. Well, I know, I know this is this is a slight deviation, I know, but when you were talking tipped nibs, um, which when you get into stub nibs, they could be tipped, they could be untipped. So this this may deviate a little bit specific from, to the stub, but when you get into tipped nibs, which is pretty much all, you know, extra fine, fine, medium, blah, 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 blah. Um, there are like very specific sizes of the tipping. So the manufacturers will have like a very specific, you know, ball size that they do for that. And then they weld it onto there. Mm-hmm. But like once you get past that point where you have just the raw like ball, everything beyond that point can have variability to it because how it's welded, you know, the the pressure that's used, the heat, the, all that kind of stuff, how it takes to the metal, the impurities in the weld. All that stuff can impact what that glob looks like once it gets onto the nib, not to mention the polishing, the grinding, all that stuff once the thing is welded on there. So, you know, that's why you can call something a 1.1, but that doesn't mean that like from the factory, it's exactly 1.1 at a specific spot. It's- but you take most, most um, you know, all, all steel stub nibs are not tipped. so. Like from a factory, yeah, like a, like like a Yovo 1.1, for example, that comes right out of the factory as is, yeah. and the width of that is more or less consistent. Yeah, but, but even still, like the the edges of it are rounded, so like right. But like I think Evie is know. saying, like why such a specific measurement 1.1? 1. 1? Like where think, did yeah. why did that start and why did that keep going? Was Everybody's there like, like, a, like was there like a global convention? Yeah, where I, like the the G eight of their the, they're like the five families of fountain yeah. pen makers got together and said let's standardize on the one point one. I think um, that probably somebody did it. It was know. a one point one, and then everybody else they, that became the standard, and everybody else was just kind of like yeah, we'll do that too. Yeah, I think I think probably honestly what happened because fountain pens have been around for a very long time. Sort of like why is the standard international converter the way that it is? Why did that? why did that converter, why that cartridge become that specific one? Um, I think it just slowly over time kind of got adopted. Like I'm sure there's some reason or explanation, but it's probably lost to history and it just wasn't recorded or something, or it was just so, you know, kind of insignificant of an event that nobody really thought about it even when it was happening. So um, I think probably, you know, knowing that there is that there are finer nibs out there. You know, we've offered custom grinds, you know, for on, on nibs and we've done we've done stub nibs that are, you know, 0.6 and 0.8 and various things. We've talked to nib meisters and that kind of stuff. We've done broader ones like Visconti's is a 1.3. Pelican has a 1.5. And you know, we know that the more there's there's basically like a standard deviation kind of bell curve around 1.1, like that tends to be the most popular, that like 1.0 to 1.2 range probably is the most popular. And then anything finer, anything broader in a stub, the demand for that tends to drop off because I think when you're talking of going finer, it you see less of a difference between a round tipped nib and a stub because you're you're basically not getting as much of a difference in variation unless you like grind it more like a a crisp italic instead of a a cursive or a stub you know by the time you've rounded over those edges you pretty much made it into a ball once you get down to 0.6 or 
you know, millimeters, because that's basically the size of a medium or broad nib. So uh, you go broader than that, and yes, you'll get more line variation, but you're kind of getting like wider than you can write and still fit within your typical line width. So then you're you're either having to take up two lines or you're just having to write really big and it's gonna stand out and look really kind of dramatic, which maybe you want for like signatures and stuff, but it becomes more of a specialized kind of nib at that point. I think in general for how most people wanna write, which is, hey, I'd like something that looks a little interesting. I want something where I don't have to change my handwriting too much, but I can still use it on my regular paper and so on, that, standard deviation tends to fall around 1.1. So I don't think it was anything decided by any manufacturer. I think probably over time, literally a hundred years, there were probably a zillion different nibs made. And as demand for fountain pens kind of evolved through its cycle and pared down and all that kind of stuff, the more obscure, less popular nibs fell away. And the one that has remained as the most popular has been the 1.1. So that's that's my theory. Yeah, and I'm sticking with the... Uh the llama theory so you know we'll see we'll see time will tell there but you go. um yeah all right cool well josh yates on youtube asks <laughs> asks us sorry Brian, josh says since last time we talked about a goulet brick and mortar store and mm. its challenges okay. and um, josh says since you don't have a brick and mortar store i wish you had simple events for fans and customers like cookouts or meet and greets after the covid wars I'm sure people would be willing to buy into a function like that to interact and make friends. I think so too. I think that's a great idea. And I think that we'd love to do it. Uh, I just don't think that we want to. Yeah, plan. Drew's gonna host it. Yeah. Drew's gonna put it all together. <laughs> no. And uh, I'd be happy to show up and just have it done. Yeah, no, no. It's <laughs> like, you know, the, the things like that is like, and we've talked about that because yes, sure. I mean, we'd love to like bring people together. I mean, that's one of the best things about this hobby and this this community. It's one of the, it's delightful. Um, and we'd love to facilitate that. But any sort of planning into something like that would mean that we're not shipping orders and we're not doing this and we're not doing all of the other things that we kind of have to do on a daily basis. None of us have an overabundance of free time. It's certainly not enough to uh, coordinate the logistics that would uh, yeah, time be required is for this. Time is definitely somewhat of an issue. Space is actually just the logistics is, oh, is, yeah. really, is really an issue. Um, so we had looked into this even a couple of years ago. We, we talked about hosting like an anniversary event when we were um, you know, coming up on our 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we theorized of like, what if we rented a place, did like a, not a pen show, but like a pen event, you know, that's pretty common for brick and mortar pen stores to do an event at their store. It makes a lot of sense. Um, part of the challenge with us doing that is, uh, for number one, we are in like an office, like warehouse location. We're not in a retail frontage store. So like the zoning for the property that we rent and literally it's in our lease that we cannot have publicly held events or really even public visitors because of parking and liability reasons and these types of things, um, certain access in and out of the building and all that. Um, we, we actually can't do that on site, which dramatically <laughs> limits the, uh, convenience of being able to host something like that. Plus it's like, if you were going to come to our place, you'd want to see our place. Right. But we, we honestly really can't do that. Um, and so we would then have to look to like host it somewhere, take over a restaurant somewhere or rent out some event or have it at a park or something. And then that's weather dependent and sounds like a nightmare. Cause this week has been like raining like crazy because we're getting hit with all these tropical storms coming up the east coast so logistically it just breaks down real quick from the simple event that you stated josh which it sounds like it should be a lot simpler than it actually ends up being um i think it's a great in theory i love pen people i would love to host something like that i just literally haven't wrapped my head around how we would actually do that and do that in a way that you know would achieve what everybody would hope that it would achieve. I mean, we could get together and have some food and meet people, but then it's like, if you want to test pens or try things or see our space or whatever, we kind of can't really do that. Um, so that eliminates a lot of it. Plus now we're in COVID life and none of that makes sense anyway. But so we can theorize about it again and talk about it once COVID starts to let up, though I don't know when that's going to be at this point because here we are shooting remotely once again, just like yeah. we were last year. But we um, got far enough into the talks and into the planning to realize that nobody in the discussions, no member of these meetings 
was capable of doing what needed to be done essentially of like leading leading point on it because we don't we don't put on events like event planning is a whole other thing like you just went to the dc show pen drew, pen show drew it's a whole thing they plan all year to put that thing on and i have no idea how many people would come to an event if we were to put one on so how big of a venue do we get venues cost money you know and food and whatever else that we would do so it's like there's got to be a budget for that kind of thing but how do you budget it when you've never done it and don't have a clue what you're doing so i don't know there's a lot of things i'm not going to say it would never happen certainly much more logistically feasible than like actually opening up a physical store but like it breaks my brain enough to say like i can't really think about that right now but no it is a cool idea and yeah. we'll keep talking about it. If we could snap our fingers and just have it done, then just make you it happen. bet. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Um, but yeah. that's another reason we actually can't have, um, we can't do local pickups. If you wanted to like, kind of pick up an order, we're not allowed to do that because of our lease. We can't like, if you wanted to bring back a return, we can't do that either. So our hands are our tied. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the physical space here is kind of, off limits. It so. is a limitation. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll need to find, so if you own a um, abandoned Chuck E. Cheese in the Metro Richmond area, give me a call and we'll work something out. Yeah. All right. Next question we've got is from a Yuval Farkey. What's your grail pen? Very simple, simple question. Mm. We get asked, we get asked this all the time, Drew. Yeah, we do. Um, you know, mine's evolved over time, especially as I've eventually acquired some grail pens that I've had, but, um, Yours, as soon as you put it on here, I knew that that I made actually sense this for has you. been my this has been my grill pen for quite a while. It started been consistent. Off as, yeah. It start it started off as the Monte Grappa Chaos pen. Um I'm a huge Stallone fan. I'm mm -hmm. one of the few people that actually really do like the expendable movies, one and two anyway. <laughs> and not not an ironic kind of way. No, no. Those movies were it. very much made with Drew Brown in mind. Um <laughs> yeah. the third one, eh, but one and two gold so that pen i love but then when montegrappa came out with the pirate pen i fell in deeper love with that one so my grail pen has been and will continue to be montegrappa's pirate pen well love the pirate it. pen it has all of the insanity and just over the topness of the chaos pen but it's pirate themed which is definitely more up your alley yeah now, what, if they, what if they did like a space themed pen in that same I would, kind of I have thing? Spent, I have spent more of my spare time reading about pirates than I have about space. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so my grail pen, I almost don't even really know if say what it is because it's, it's not a pen that's made. You can't get it. And uh, I feel like even by saying what it is that Anybody who could get it would get it, and then I would never have a chance of getting it. But I'm probably not going to get. It. I'm probably not going to get it anyway. So I'll be honest. Um, so I didn't even know this pen existed until maybe a couple of years ago. But apparently, Namiki, which pretty much any Namiki is like Grail pen territory. Let's be real. Um, but they made you know the Yukari Nightline Moonlight, right? Yeah, the You're moon, familiar moon, with that. It's just moon, covered moon, in moon, moon, moon life nightlight. The Moonlife Nightline, yeah. The, no, Nightlight, moon, <laughs> night moon, Moonline. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we always get it confused. Um, but apparently they made a Nightline in the Emperor size. So oh. having a Namiki Emperor with that all rotten Nightline, that would pretty much do it. I that forgot it. I forgot. It. I remember you telling me about this a while ago, but I totally forgot that they did something like this. I've they never seen one. They didn't make many of them. It was super rare. I want to say it was 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and I'm sure if 15, you even find one now, you're probably 15 or 20 grand too. You're probably, yeah, you're into the five digits for sure. And look, I'm obsessed with pens. I'm in the pen business. I would have every reason to try to justify a pen, but even I really struggle in that price range. Even if I came across one, it would be very difficult to pull that trigger. So anyway, if you have one or you happen to know anybody who's got one, awesome, more power to you. I will live vicariously through you, but it's, that's my unrealistic, um, you know, grail pen, which I think, you know, that's kind of fun. That's like when you yeah. like, what supercar would I drive if I could, you know, McLaren F1. Uh, so like, yeah, totally. But like, what's my realistic car? Like a 97 Dodge Viper GTS. Okay, cool. <laughs> realistic? Like, yeah. Like not, not practical, no, but okay. attainable, you know, I could theoretically get one, right? Like they're, they exist like a McLaren F1, <laughs> like forget it. They're like, two million dollars or something at this point like i could never get one it's totally impractical i couldn't even get insurance for that thing i'm sure but like you know anyway 
I just, I was at my parents and I was like clearing out like some old childhood stuff. I was obsessed with the McLaren F1 when I was in middle school. Yes. And uh, Drew can attest to this. I drew pictures of it. I wrote every like English paper thing we had to write was like just spewing facts about the McLaren F1. I'm sure my teacher was just like, God, will this kid shut up about this stupid thing, whatever it is. Anyway, yeah, so. Um, so that the the Emperor Nightline would be my McLaren F1. Well, you, of you, you, you didn't say you didn't finish your thought about the yeah, what you I, what you found. I'm getting I'm getting. Oh, I found a drawing that I yeah. did. Um, oh man, I should have thought to grab it, but maybe I'll I'll take a picture of it and we can yeah. overlay it. But uh, you know, it's not, not a terrible drawing if I do. No, so I myself. thought it was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually can't draw that well anymore. I don't. I lost my touch. Um, anyway, I can't, I've never been able to do anything symmetrical like a car. Yeah, yeah. So my uh, my realistic Grail pen would be the Omos 360. I think I've actually even mentioned this many times in the Q and A and stuff over the years. That's the triangular pen. Mm -hmm. That was one that I had my eye on, and as soon as we picked up Omos, which is like right at the end of their life, I was so wanting to get a 360 for myself, but they were kind of on the decline though we didn't realize it at that time, and they weren't really making any more, and then it just kind of slipped away, and then it entered into Omos is going away, and you can't get these anymore, and the prices went through the roof and the availability, and I was just like, this is just not, you know, I don't want it that much so that would kind of fit that's my dodge viper of a uh, grail pen you know i want it but not bad enough to like actually like pay for it but it's cool so anyway if, fair enough if it were given to me i wouldn't throw it away let's put it falls into that territory okay yeah i don't think i would throw any pen away but um i'd save i'd sell them all so to get a pirate yeah i don't think i've ever thrown a pen away. maybe i've thrown like a preppy or something away that i like sat on and cracked but i, I don't know that i've ever really thrown a pen away that's even no. somewhat usable no like, i save not. everything all right. that's true i can attest to that yeah. um so cookie conveyor which is a great name because sometimes i just want to be a cookie, cookie conveyor, conveyor seven cookie conveyor seven There's seven that's right, six that's others, right. there, six there have been there. six previous cookie conveyors <laughs> let's hope let's hope this one holds out. Anyway, Cookie Conveyor asks, why are factory steel stub nibs untipped? This kind of goes back to our previous uh, conversations. Why not put tipping on them, Brian? Did you do that on purpose, Drew? Did you put two stub questions in here to pair well with each other? Uh, no, I didn't think that we would deviate into the tipped versus untipped thing in that first question, but we did anyway. So okay, maybe I subconsciously brought us there when I looked at the question. There you um, go. Um, yeah. So, um, I think probably it's due mostly to the like economic reasons of it, like cost, you know, cost saving reasons. Um, you know, factory stainless steel nibs, if you have like an extra fine or a fine nib, there's not as much of the metal that's making contact with the paper. So therefore, you know, the friction and stuff, it's going to wear down, you know, kind of on a single point more quickly. So it's, it's advantageous to still put tipping on those, even with a steel nib. And by the time you get to a stub nib, you've really kind of spread out the, you know, writing pad, uh, you know, the portion that's actually touching the paper, you've spread it out, you know, uh, multitudes more than you would have on a, a traditional round nib. So I think that, you know, yes, metallurgically, you are still going to have more wear on an untipped stainless steel stub nib than you would on a tipped one. Uh, but I think that the degree that you're gonna have wear occur on a nib like that, um, in order to have it as a tipped nib, it's gonna require so much handwork and therefore labor that would factor into the cost of that nib. It's actually probably more economical just to get a new nib and replace it than it would be to to tip it. You know, gold nib makes sense. Gold is expensive. So the labor to tip it m makes sense. Um, and you can kind of build that in there. Plus gold wears way faster than steel. You don't want a gold untipped nib. Which um, Omos used to have. They did, and it had problems. <laughs> so that was the only nib that I can ever remember in modern times that was a gold untipped nib. And we had yeah. questions about that. We were like, why is this the case? And they were like, no, nah, it'll be fine. And then they like went out of business and then we got a bunch of returns and people are like, my nib is now sharp and flat. And then we were like, crap, okay. <laughs> I remember that very well. <laughs> I was on the front lines of that one. 
it wasn't a ton of them. We didn't know. I mean, we just weren't experienced at that time. No. We always try to make it right for anybody. And if, of course, if you, if you bought one of those pens years ago from us and you feel wronged in some way, let us know. We'll make it right for you. We can't get you another nib, but you know, we'll figure something out. But uh, anyway, that was the only that was the only pen that I could think of that was an example of an untipped gold nib. But so you don't really want that gold too soft. Um, no. You know, and if you I look think, at the if you look at the iridium alloy orbs or whatever alloy they use the 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 mm -hmm. spheres that they actually do kind of tack weld onto the tip of the steel nibs mm -hmm. or gold yeah. nibs for that matter they're always you know small-ish spheres and yeah. in order to oh, very, small. very small yeah in order to get one that would cover the entirety of a you know stub nib that's already shaped you know wide like that you're talking about a sphere probably mm -hmm. two or three times the size of what they use for a broad it's a big and, old blob, yeah. Yeah, big old and that, blob. That, that yeah. stuff, that stuff. Um, even if it doesn't contain any iridium, which a lot of them or most of them don't anymore, Not it's really. still a costly alloy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's usually rhodium. Usually, like it's a hard precious metal. Which the cost of any precious metal like that, anything in the platinum family, is really expensive. So when you go up to something like you know, kind of what Drew said, it just it goes to the economy of it. You know, to, to put tipping on a stub nib costs a lot more, cause, especially because it's, by the time you weld it on there, there's way more, you know, fine detail work. There's many steps that are required for grinding a stub nib by hand, as opposed to a round nib, because a round nib, you just have to make sure it's round all the way, you know, around the thing. But a stub nib, there's a specific pattern that has to be ground and then rounded and smoothed. And it's, it's just much more time consuming. That's why if you ever look at a custom nibmeister and you look at the costs that they have with doing custom grinds, you know, stub nibs and cursive italics and all that kind of stuff is going to be up there in terms of the more expensive offerings that they have just because of the number of steps and time required. So I really think it's just an economy thing. Yep. And Sweet. they want to keep, they want to keep the stub nibs the same cost as all the other ones. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm kind of glad, I'm kind of glad too, because yeah, me too. it's nice to have affordable, it's nice to have affordable stub nibs because otherwise I don't know that that many people would ever try them and i think stub nibs are fantastic i'm a huge fan of them it was part of what i fell in love with the most when i first got into fountain pens because i thought it was like calligraphy for people that don't really want to take the time to learn calligraphy yep it, like, my first one was a lamy 1.1 <laughs> there you go perfect all right drew hypothetical you have hyped are you this ready up. you've hyped this up for me and I'm excited I, for I'm it. I'm really excited about this one. This one's a fun one. And I hope I haven't already asked you about this one, but I, I, I might have. But it's, it's one of my favorite ones. And uh, okay. I like to think about it often. I, I have a hard time uh, landing on one myself. Okay, so $3 million, Brian. You either get a $3 million yacht or a $3 million RV, which stands for recreational vehicle. Okay. So the, the, the kicker here is that essentially a $3 million RV is the best RV in existence. Like if you look it up, a $3 yeah. million RV is like the best ever. A $3 million, uh, $3 million yacht is nice-ish, but you can find, you know, ones, you know, multi Tudes larger oh, they, and more they expensive. They have like than that. hundred million dollars. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, it's either you know a pretty good one on one end or the best of one. So, uh, caveats because I know you're going to ask. Oh, yeah. You have infinite gas. You do not need to pay for fuel on either okay. one. Okay. Uh, there are no taxes and or fees for owning or okay. storing this vehicle. Oh, because that makes and, a difference with a boat. For oh, sure. I know. I know. I'm ready for you, boy. Okay. All right. No maintenance required. Okay. And we're, and, com uh, we're completely surpassing reality here at this point. But okay. well, I need to. We need to get this. You're trying done. to level. You're trying to level the playing field a little bit. Here. Yes, I I, we can't I be you. talking about this for another thirty minutes. Um, and then also, you would instantly be a perfect driver slash operator. So you know, oh, okay. You so like, you don't I, need to worry about that. I don't know how to drive a boat, but I would. Right, you, if you I would. That. You would, and you, okay. you would need to drive them both. You wouldn't have a driver, but you would need to. Uh, you'd need to operate them, but uh, you'd be good at it. Well, see, that's the thing. You have to have. A, a, a boat captain like because the boat's on the water 24 hours a day so if you're sailing somewhere you can you can you can store it no i mean like when you're traveling like you like with a yacht you can like travel across the atlantic ocean and go to the mediterranean i don't i don't know i looked it up um you just can do it, yeah you can yeah i don't absolutely. know if all of, i don't know if all of them can do this the, the yacht that i looked up was a 2018 well, used there's a three million dollar one you better friggin be able I don't to drive that i don't thing. i don't think so brian this one was called no, 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 no 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 like like i don't okay i don't like hang out with a lot of boat people but like i know of like 
tangentially people yeah. who have boats and do sailing and stuff like that. It's not uncommon, even if you're just going like up the East Coast, right, for example, to sail like overnight, like you're trying to get up the coast, it might take a week. So you like have a crew, a small crew or a captain or somebody who helps drive the boat so that you're not literally driving the boat like 24 hours oh, yeah, a day. No, you, you would not have that. Unless you have like a family of people and you just rotate within your family, that's possible. You you and Rachel could rotate, but uh, th- this is a uh, this is a fifty seven like, foot. You like going to drive a boat? Are you kidding me? I'm just saying. I'm just she saying. Is you not have limits. Drive a boat. You don't She's have a crew. You're not getting a crew. You have a fifty seven foot used twenty eighteen offshore yacht. Meaning okay. you're not going to go to the Bahamas a, with this a, thing. A Tesla self driving yacht. No, is, no, we're talking about- <laughs> no. We're I could talking drive three. it if I want to, but I could just set it on autopilot and it could just yeah, go. Yeah, so no, you, you would need to, if you're going up the East Coast, you need to drive for a while and you need to moor it and you need to drive okay. for a while and then you need to, well, not moor it, but park it, what, dock it, whatever. Whatever, I don't boat know. Boat speak. I'm not a right, boat so, person. All right, so do you want the best of the best RV or a pretty darn good yacht? Um, For me, it's hands down RV. Not even a question i would so take why like, are we talking so much about the yacht details then i'm oh just God. making i'm just making your life hard <laughs> oh i would take like i would take like a fifty thousand dollar like rv over a three million dollar yacht nice okay like i just for me i love well i love being on the land i like having my feet on something solid you know so i'm like i'm not crazy about being way high up in the air i, I fly just fine but i'm not like wild about it not really crazy about being on the water. I like being firmly planted on soil. So that in general, plus the things I like to do, I love the woods, I love the mountains. I love the, just the scenery, the, you know, diversity of life and all that kind of stuff that comes with like forest, forested areas. Um, so just in terms of a lifestyle, the places that I would go RVing, like national parks type stuff, is just much more suited to my liking than, I mean, pretty much if you have a boat, you're on the water and you go to places that are on the water. And it's it's a very, very similar kind of, I mean, yes, if you go to like different countries, different continents, you get different vibes, but it's pretty much like, you know, it's the beach people, you know, that are running all these little marinas and stuff like that. So it's a very similar kind of vibe that you get at all these places. But with an RV, you can get, you can go all over the place. You can just get a much more diversity of landscape and all these different things. So RV, no question. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I absolutely agree with you. I'm, I feel the same way. I'm not a, I'm not a beach person. So um, yeah. Yeah. I'm a fan of uh, terra firma. Yeah, though yeah. there are some there are some cool yachts out there though. Some great YouTube videos of yeah, well we yachts had being to, built I, and I found a price range that both yachts and exist and RVs existed. Um, so uh, three million seems to be like the wow. You, there doesn't really seem to exist a plus three million dollar RV. I'm sure it can happen, but I mean, if you take the very best RV that for three million, and then you just change out all the hardware to like solid gold sink handles and stuff like that, yeah, sure, I guess you could go up there. But operationally, I think it kind of caps out at three million. But then again, I did research for like two seconds, so don't listen to me. There you go. So if you have a more than three million dollar RV, please comment below. Yeah, let me know and let us know, and uh, you can invite us out, and we'll come and check it out and report yeah, well, back. Just, just to you know, a fact finding mm-hmm. mission. There you go. All cool. right. Well, there's our hypothetical. Well done, Brian. That was Thank remarkably you, decisive. Thank you. Um, so I know we didn't have a specific flex segment in here today, and I'm no. I'm I'm at risk of putting in something here that I didn't even talk to you about nor do I even know if I'm gonna have the time or ability to do this, but I'm just gonna kind of put it out there, kind of gauge some interest maybe. So I had a kind of a fleeting idea earlier today as I was thinking I was about the pencast. I was like, we're trying to do this a little more weekly, Um, you know, and I was just thinking like, I've got, personally, I've just got a lot going on in my life, some stuff that I can't really talk about because it's just like personal stuff and things with like extended family and stuff like that. Everything's fine, but you know, I'm not going to go into the droves of that. It's just taking a disproportionate amount of my time. Um, and I'm just having a little harder time, like spending time writing with fountain pens a little bit. It, it happens. It ebbs and flows with all of us. Um, but I was like, you know, it'd be kind of cool to like have some reason, some incentive to, you know, write with some specific pens and, um, you know, kind of report back in the pen cast, especially now that we're doing it more regularly. So my rough idea and Drew, maybe we can just riff while we have an audience here. Um, but my idea was to have like a pen of the week sort of thing where basically we like pick a pen and like try to use that pen 
more, you know, primarily, not exclusively or whatever, but just try to like make a concerted effort to use that pen, you know, throughout the week. And we say what the pen's going to be for the following week. We come back in the pen cast the next week. I'm not saying we're going to do like all these exhaustive tests and stuff like that, because you know how time consuming that can be. But basically just kind of report back and be like, you know, whether it's a pen that's like, yeah, platinum preppy. I haven't like actually inked up and used one of those in quite some time, but like, I wonder what I would do with a platinum preppy over the next week and just have that as my go-to pen and report back and be like, yeah, I had this pen in my pocket, in my hot car, and it spilled all over my shorts or, or whatever, or it was actually great and I forgot how much I love this pen. You know, and just kind of gauging it like that. So that was my thought, not really making a firm commitment on that, but really just kind of wanted to put it out there that maybe it would be kind of fun for me personally um, just to have like a, a stated intention of using a given pen um, and then kind of rotate it out on a weekly basis and, and report back. Because what I'm finding is that as my time is less and less, I'm tending to just use the pen that I've been using and keep the same ink in it so I don't have to clean it and all that kind of stuff. And that just gets really boring in a pen cast when I'm like, well, I still have the Lamy 2000 and it's still writing well. You know, I feel like I could do better as a pen personality on here. So I wanted to throw that out to you, Drew, see what you thought about that. I didn't. I, I, I'm all for it. I think honestly, I was a little terrified when you started talking, but uh, now I am comfortable yeah. and serene. I I'm trying to like make it as non-committal as possible. Oh, the freaking squirrel! That squirrel figured out how to get into our bird feeder. I'll be oh. done. We have one of those bird feeders where it's like the weight of the the bar that the bird sits on, like closes the door to the the food. Mm -hmm. That squirrel, he's just like perched on that thing. Son of a gun. <laughs> He finally figured, he couldn't for a long time figure out like he had to even get up there. Now he's, yeah, see that door is closed now. He had it open for a second, but nah, he's on there. <laughs> Shut he's, down. He's trying so hard to get in there. Uh, yeah, punk, that's what you get. <laughs> These squirrels, man, they're so, they're so determined. Oh, now that door is open now. Now that you jumped off it, you big turd. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I've oh tried to God. get video footage of the squirrel and it's it's quite difficult. But anyway, uh, what was no, I, I think talking about? A, I think that's a great idea. I do want to do you want to actually um, do you want to do the same pen or do you want me to do a pen? You to do a pen? I literally have told you everything that I've thought this through so okay, far. Okay, well let's decide. Let's decide right now. Hey, do we, do we both want to write with a preppy for the next week or do you want to write with a preppy and I'll oh, do I, like? I wasn't a, proposing a preppy. I don't know. We could just pick anything. I, I mean, you you said preppy, so I, mean, I said no. I said one or both of us could do this. I definitely was not trying to coordinate because then I think that that gets challenging. I think it'd be more interesting if we if we each pick a different pen personally because okay. I don't know that I don't know that like you and I using the same pen would necessarily. Add a lot of value, but I don't know. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. Maybe we'll just. I figure let's test it out in the least committal, most convenient way first. Let's see if it adds any value to the pen cast, and if people really like it, then we can put a little more effort into it. So I thought I would just kind of kind of drop it in here and say, let's just you and I each pick a pen. We'll try primarily using that pen, and then we'll just next week we'll talk about what we thought about using that pen more. All right. Do you want to pick so, a pen now or later? Good question. Let's pick a pen now because I feel okay. like. I'm not going to even remember that I committed to this afterwards if I don't do it now. All right. Um, hmm. Let's see. I, I, what do I have within like grabbing distance? Um, I will say I, I acquired a new sailor that I have not written with extensively. And up until now, the only sailor I had was a one with a Sabi Togi nib, so a very unique writing experience. However, at the DC Pen Show, I acquired a 21 karat um, Pro Gear that uh, I have not really written with all that much. So I will commit to experiencing this 21 karat. Uh, this was a, an extra fine. Wow. All right. That's uh, that's pretty cool. I'm trying to look at what I've got here. Do you think I should go like something a little nicer or should I go something a little more economical? Um, try sub hmm. 300. That definitely will not be difficult to achieve. Okay. Let's see here. Um, I got a Twisby right here. What kind I of Twisby? Definitely go the Twisby route. This is a uh, 580 ALR. Hmm. I would love to see you write with something really small for a while. Really small, like a yeah. traveler, like a traveler's brass Ooh, pen. Yeah. Do you do the traveler's brass pen? 
You, yeah. you, you with your hands, yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to see what your verdict is because I know you like that pen, but using it for a, a, I've got a straight... The, uh, I've got the Traveler's Brass Pen, the Factory Green. Yeah, use that one because you've got bigger hands, and I think that, you know, I know you, you're a fan of those pens, but I think you, I'm, I'm curious about whether or not you can use one extensively for, you know, a week and still have the same favorable opinion or you would be like, no, it's too small. Okay. Cartridge only. This is going to be go. toughy. Yeah, that's a good one. Should I stick to a has to be a cartridge ink or can I refill a cartridge? Do you yeah, think? do what you want, man. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do whatever I want. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I will use the Traveler's factory pen, factory green. Solid. And you're gonna use the Sailor. Yeah. All right. And we'll report back next week. Let y'all know what you think. And if you got any other ideas of pens that you would like to see us use, I, again, we're not committing to what we're actually gonna say about the pens. Maybe we'll figure it out. I'm trying not to, you know, to do an actual full pen review with like everything that people want to see takes like. 15 hours like it's ridiculous how long it takes to actually produce that content but unless we make it really bad yeah we can make it really quick and not very conclusive and not really represent it well visually or auditorily or what do you call it when you do something in writing olfactorily olfactor olfactory no that that, that, that's smell never mind that's smell (laughs) what do you call it when it's writing uh there's a Uh, word for it i'm sure it's ironic. Literarily? I, liter, lit, lit, literarily? I mean, it's not literally because no. that's just something know. else. I don't know. All right. Well, cool. We'll try that out. It might yes. be. If we come back next week and we're like, yeah, I didn't really write with anything. I have nothing really to say. Then we'll be like, well, that didn't that. work. That didn't work. On to something else. But we'll see. No, I think I think we can keep each other accountable. Fair enough. All right. All right. What's happening? Drew, what's what happening? Is what's happening? happening in your life? Well, believe it or not, Brian, I've been playing some video games. Surprise, surprise. Oh, that's a shocker. I know, but you know what? I'm revisiting an oldie for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, the wonderfully delightful Chrono Trigger, which is a really, really good RPG from uh, 95, I think. Um, it's like a time travel RPG. You can go to like different time periods. You can like put something in one time period and you go forward a couple hundred years and it's like different. It's You can get different characters. You get like a robot, but then you get a cave woman and you get a, a frog knight and it's so good. It's it's so good. And I know it's always been nice. good. I've played it through a bunch of times, but I'm doing it again. I'm almost at the end and I'm loving it. The music is amazing. I'm going to send you a YouTube video and make you listen to some of that because... You do have a good taste for video game music. Oh my God. That's I will like admit. half the reason I play old games these days. Fair so enough. that's fun. Um, last Pencast, I mentioned that I was having hamburger-shaped hot dogs or hot dog-shaped hamburgers. You know, I was going to roll the oh, beef absolutely. into a... Yeah, that was amazing. That was delightful. So you roll it... amazing. Yeah, you just roll it into a hot dog shape, put it on a bun with some lettuce, some tomato chunks delightful just delightful so i'm gonna do that again that was a winner tomato chunks doesn't sound super appealing but i get Wait, what you're you put, saying you put tomatoes on your burger right um i have mixed feelings about tomatoes on burgers i was always kind of a burger purist like that's how joseph is he's like burger cheese maybe ketchup that's it oh you gotta have a good i'm 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 good I'm, good I'm, I'm a little slice. picky about that because what i don't like is i don't think i don't like things sliding around while i'm trying to bite it yeah. And a burger is like classic, like you got the burger with the cheese and then you throw like a slice of lettuce and a tomato on top of that. It's like, you clearly just don't want to hold that thing in your hand while you try no, to bite it. No, you gotta, you gotta gonna have the, bur- the, the tomato needs to go just between beef and bun. Put the lettuce under the beef or somewhere else because otherwise you get slip yeah. and slide. You don't but that's that. never that's never how you get it when you go to like a restaurant. No, that's, that's true, that's true. Fair that enough. stuff's just always piled on top and you're just left looking like a fool trying to bite <laughs> this thing that's sliding all out of your hands. and. And That's then it's true. like but you, you get like what? one, you get like one little napkin, and you're like, "What am I supposed to do with this?" Yeah. Like, I'm clearly, I can't do. I'm committed, like start to finish with this burger. I once I take a bite, the thing I can't put it down because I'll never be able to pick it back up. It's lost all its integrity. I have to like encase it in my hands and just eat the entire thing yeah. in one continuous like motion, <laughs> and then like. You know, I, for, heaven forbid, I have to go to the bathroom or like I want to take a sip of something nope. or if, you know, my kid has something and I need to like help him, forget it, lost cause. So sometimes I, I flip my burger upside down because I, that the bottom bun is always so pathetic compared mm. to the top bun. Like, why do they make the top bun bigger? The bottom one is what needs the support. 
It's a good like, point. That that it's a good it point. Get, it gets soggy. It, it, it's it's that's the platform. That's the yeah. that is the 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 plinth, right? Is that what they call it? No, plinth. plinth. That is the plinth of the burger. That's I'm the. Really sharp. I don't know what that word uh, pl- is. But. Plinth is the uh, the column that statues stand on top of. Huh. Did a not marble, know that. Marble plinth. I mean, I'm that. saying that, but then I'm going to get, I'll, I'll get back say, to you, should ne- I, should I I'll get back to you next quick? week about why it? that's wrong. I'm going to Google but plinth and it's going to be like something offensive. Re- anyway. Okay. But also, Brian, I got my plinth. kids. No, you're right. I, a heavy base supporting a statue or vase. Plinth. Burgerplinth.com. Con- congratulations. All right. Drew. You should start a restaurant, Drew, selling burgers made of pancake like batter. With like sausage patties or something, and call it plinth. I'm I'm offended by that. I would just sell burgers upside down and call it plinth. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. There we go. But All Brian, right. I got my toy accordion. Hey, look at that! That I said that I was going to get in. You mean and your 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 can, can uh, what is it called? Can, it's not can, this. This is technically an accordion. It's not a concertina. Concertina. Um, that's what it was. Yeah, this is just a kid's accordion, um, but it's only got like. A few buttons on it so okay it's like it doesn't have keys like an accordion does it's just got right. these plastic buttons but right. i you learned gonna, a, i learned you gonna a thing you're gonna play this little song i learned say. a thing and i want to see if you can if want to see if you can get it okay all right it's very creaky well so I, it is a I mean, child, it is a children's toy so it is a children's toy. we'll let it slide yeah we'll, we'll let it slide all right get ready i have so, not heard this yet this is my raw reaction i'm gonna see if i can remember <laughs> this because normally i have to read it but Okay. I think I can. I think I can remember. All right. Oh. oh no! It's supposed to be the office <laughs> theme, but I, I forgot. Is, I can tell. I can tell. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh no! Dang it! <laughs> I had the whole thing. <laughs> I forgot. And well. I can that do sound- the whole thing. I just forgot it. I'm getting nervous. That sounds a little better than I expected, to be honest. Yeah, with you. it's good. Can you play chords? Like, does it play multiple notes at the same time, or is it I mean, just yeah, one there, at there time? are there are um, there are yeah? letters on here, but I don't really know what they mean. I'm just pretty much memorizing what I can. Okay. Um, you just like uh, you're just like feeling. You're just like playing what the instrument is speaking to you. That's it. That's it. I'm hundred. I'm very very <laughs> yeah, hundred percent involved in uh, it speaking to me. But nice. I, I swear I can play the whole thing. I'm just fumbling it because I'm on the spot in front of thousands of people. You are on the spot. <laughs> Go uh, back to that first note. It's the same note as the first note you played. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Eh, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep suffer, making you suffer through that, but <laughs> I promise I can do it. I promise. Wow, well, that's pretty uh, that's pretty great, Drew. It's so much fun. I'm having a great time with it. Nice, that's yeah, awesome. My, and uh, you know, and then Shannon doesn't hate it, so that that's good news too. Well, if she doesn't yet, I'm sure she will. Yeah. Well, <laughs> time time will tell. Time will tell. Oh, that's great. Uh, so yeah, that's been that's been me. What are you up to? Uh, I had my own acquisition um, of something that we've been talking about on the pencast here. This was a bit of an impulse buy, but uh, we were talking about you know like which which car that we would want, and I mentioned like the Dodge Charger from Fast and Furious. Yes. Well, any diehard Lego fans will know that currently there is a Lego Technic set of. Dom's Charger oh, from the Fast goodness. and Furious, the iconic 1970 there it is. Charger RT. It was an absolute impulse buy because I love Lego Technic. I love Lego Technic vehicles specifically. Um, and uh, I wasn't planning to buy this one, but after we talked about it, I talked myself into it. And Joseph's been really digging the Lego thing. It's good quality time. And so, yeah, it just, it happened. And you know, the thing with Lego sets, like pens, they come out with these kits and they're around for like a year or two and then they go away and then yep. they go up like four times in price. And I have a number of kits where I'm like, dang it, I wish I bought that specific one. I kind of wanted it and then I said I wouldn't get it and now I want it, but I'm not going to pay it. So I just don't have it. And that's fine. Look, that's life. But I was like, this one, okay. I just, I kind of sprung for it. So there we go. Got Dom's charger. 
it's kind of fun so joseph nice. joseph saw it on the table i just got it in like a couple of days ago and he saw it and he was like are we gonna get to build that together and i was like yeah we are so he's really excited about it okay um, hey i found i found my instructions <laughs> i'm gonna try it one more time oh bro, okay okay here we go redeem feel, yourself feel, this is i'm very this is very personal for me all right go for it oh no no close no four four This is why I failed drama, Brian. This is why I failed drama. Practice makes I, progress, Drew. I, no, I can do it. I just choke. I choke under pressure. I got up. You for just gotta my keep doing it. You got to no. choke more. Choke more I, in front of people. Eventually, <laughs> eventually, that'll be going oh, too. It's so bad. I failed drama I because you. I got up for my my monologue that I knew front, backwards, and sideways. I got up in front of people, and I said my name, and I couldn't get out a single word of my monologue because mm. I just was terrified, and then. Got a zero for my final exam. That counted as 50% of my final grade. So Drew Brown fails drama. Which is funny because you live drama in your everyday life. When it's natural, yeah. But when I'm on the spot, I just can't do anything. It's That's terrible. right. You're like Jenna Maroney who wants to get an Oscar for living life theatrically. I am not like Jenna Maroney. <laughs> oh my God. I'm more like Pete uh, Hornberger. Oh, uh, yes. Who we met in person, by the way, Drew and I together. We got yes. to meet at a Scott Adsit in person. Yes, we did. We saw him at, at the, the airport. airport, and we stopped him, and we fanned out, and he we, seemed scared. We didn't stop him. One of us <laughs> insist. One of us I insisted on down. chasing him down, while the other one was like, "Please don't. Let's leave him alone. Let's let him live his life." <laughs> Drew was like, "Let him live his life," and I was like, "No, he's a celebrity. He. God. This is his burden. He uh. must run into <laughs> random fans at the airport." <laughs> we were nice about it, but yeah, he was yeah, definitely, no, he was he definitely was, like, Ugh, "Who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, at least I'm we sure just cool. at least we didn't just scream Hornburger at him. That's right. Could have yeah, been worse. We could have. Um, Drew, you'll be very proud of an experience that I had in the last week. So Joseph and I went and got our hair cut together, which you notice my hair is looking much more tame this week than it was last week. Um, so Joseph put together this like playlist, which is basically all video game music from like Sonic the Hedgehog and other things. Which was pretty, it's pretty delightful. Yeah, he's like, he's a, he's a kid of your own heart. Good um, man. And so I was like, you know, Joseph, if you like this, he had some, he had some pretty good, like kind of driving like rock type songs on there. It's like Drew, or Joseph, I was like, have you ever heard Dragon Force? <laughs> and he was like, what is that? And I was like, let me play you <laughs> through the fire and flames. <laughs> and so I put that on, it was like seven and a half minutes of just intense, just complete rocking out and insanity and then we watched a couple of music videos of them playing live and it was just, it was it was awesome so got to introduce joseph and he was just like eyes like wide the whole time as we were driving <laughs> to this thing and i was like joseph this is like these are real instruments these guys are actually playing this music and he was like what anyway so that was pretty great got to introduce joseph to some you know some they actually um herman lee their guitarist he is actually heavily inspired by video game music big Oh, big yeah. Fan, big fan of video game tunes. They've got a bunch of their songs that are used in video game music. That's oh, actually, yeah. that's how they blew up really was they were on Guitar Hero and Rock Band and that's mm -hmm. how most people got to really know them. Um, so yeah, good stuff. Uh, and then the other thing, not as fun, but you know, kids are getting ready to go back to school and there's all kinds of fun and interesting debate about what it means to safely bring our children back to school. So as many people are dealing with right now with children in school, there are all kinds of lively and spirited debates about how to go about this. And we have been dealing with that with our particular locale. So that has been just just a wonderful experience, very uplifting and a bright spot in our lives in regards to societal interactions and unity. I'm among having a hard time believing strangers. you right now, Brian. You know, I am just choosing to look at the good oh, okay. in the world. Okay. Um, so yeah, that hasn't been anything that's been heavily on our minds. Definitely at not all. stressful at all. No, but our kids will start school in a few weeks here. Um, Virginia tends to start a little bit later than most other places, so it seems. So we will see how all that goes. But anyway, that's definitely taken up a lot of our time, more COVID stuff. And in general, just our, our company's been dealing with that and, you know, all the things. So 
we're all kind of in it together and figuring it all out. In fact, that was like the only company update I really had. I didn't have much else to talk yeah, about. There so we go. We'll kind of just like gloss over that subject this week and then we'll touch on what's on our desk and then we'll bounce. All right. Well, what is on my desk? I wrote with that new ink that I told you about earlier today, the private Ooh. reserve two minutes till midnight blue. That was mm -hmm. neat. Um, honestly, it was nice to write with a you know, exclusive limited edition ink that didn't have anything absolutely crazy about it. I actually yeah. appreciated that. It's just a nice dark blue and yeah. no, no crazy sheen, no crazy shimmer. It's a nice deep blue that I will put gladly in a fountain pen and not have to worry about any sort of upkeep. Right now, I'm kind of into that. So uh, I enjoyed nice. it quite a bit. Awesome. And it, remi and it reminds me of my, uh, or one of my favorite Iron Maiden songs. Yes. Yes. It does remind you of that, doesn't it? Very heavily, in fact. There is an Iron yes. Maiden song called Two Minutes to Midnight. And I definitely think that's not just... definitely not correlated in any way whatsoever because that would be a trademark violation. No, no. So I want to be very they, clear. They would not do that. But it, it is it is a fun coincidence. It is pretty interesting, isn't it? Indeed. <laughs> and now I'm gonna fess up to the viewing public and uh my good friend Brian Goulet here that I have been breaking my three pen ink up rule um, oh yeah oh, yes yeah. yes so the innova that i have here i inked up when the private reserve infinity inks came out because i wanted to test them so that's still okay. inked up this uh -huh. is number four and then the oh, sailor so, you, that, so you've broken it even further i knew you went to four i didn't realize you went beyond well, four th this this pen that i got at the dc show was already inked so i don't mm. even know what's in here so technically, mm -hmm. I have five pens inked up. My Van Gogh has yes. dry, dried up Sailor yes. 123 in it, or uh, Rain Fluff, I should say. Let the, um, let no, the no, 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 no. Let it's, the it's, anger it is consume a, It is a fleeting <laughs> moment. It is a fleeting lapse mm -hmm. in judgment that will mm -hmm. be corrected mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. But when was just, the DC pen show again? When was that? Two, two weeks ago? Recently. Two weeks ago? So recently. It's two weeks now you've had five pens one, inked up? One weekend ago. Mm, okay. Well, that's what we're going to say. Okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. And you've been playing video. You've been doing other things. It's not that you haven't had time to clean out your pens. This has been a conscious choice to continue to leave all five of these pens inked up. What's I'm on just your desk? What's I'm on just clarifying. What's on your desk, Brian? Hmm? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm just going to tease because I've been working on some exclusives and I can't talk about them. But they're going to be really exciting, and they're come they're coming along really well. So finalized finalized some things, and uh, that's really all I can say. It's going to be a while before I can actually talk about them. But I'll be like, hey, remember a long time ago when I talked about something I couldn't talk about? That was this. So that's that's kind of it. That's I all actually I, can, I actually don't I know. I, I, do do I know about this? Uh, so you were out for a couple of days, so you know about one of them. The other one. I don't know how much you've maybe caught up on it, but mm. you you and I have not specifically conversed about this other thing. That okay, happened. well, I'm right with you, folks. <laughs> Clueless as to what that guy is talking about. There you go. And It'll that's be worth fine. It. That's It'll be fine. Worth it. I promise you. All right, All right, if you say so. And that's what we got for this week, everybody. So we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Leave us some comments on YouTube. Or you can shoot us an email at pencast at gulepens.com. And we're going to close out today with a fun and random fact that bees can fly higher than 29,525 feet above sea level, according to National Geographic. That is higher than Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. Bees. That's like six miles up in the air. They're like almost sub. It's crazy. Bees, little honeybees. Crazy. Almost I don't know how they. Suborbital. Right? Isn't it suborbital like 10 I miles up or something like that? 8 miles, 10 miles? Come on, space guy. You know. I'm not space you know guy. Things. We established this. I'm pirate guy now. Well, you're both in my mind. <laughs> space if pirates. You, if you know more about it than me, then you're that guy. Space pirates. Now you're talking. There you go. I feel like that's a thing. Is that a thing? Maybe it's it, a thing. It definitely is a thing in any sort yeah. of uh, you know sci-fi movies. There's always there's always space pirates. Space pirates. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Cool. All right. That's all we got for this week, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on episode number twelve. Hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll catch you next time. Right on. <laughs>